And I'm going to drop a link here real quick. And then Walter, appreciate you again, just dropping that into the class schedule. Super crazy helpful. I will have that here in a second. Come on. Oh, hang on. I don't want to problems. All right, there we go. Boom. Okay, there it is. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm feeling great, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Um, I decided to lose the uh, Stinky Pete look. You know what I mean? I was crossing the threshold from Stinky Pete making a hard turn into Santa land again and uh, decided that, you know, now that I was mobile, I could, you know, get out of my house and uh, go go find a different look because uh, I think Stinky Pete is not the ultimate destiny for a white haired man like myself. So, I mean, it's a look and it's a look I can rock, it turns out, especially if I can get that hat just right. Same with Sad Santa, which I think some of you saw my Sad Santa stuff. Um, all right. Hey, thanks, Gomez. I feel clean. I feel clean. I feel good. Okay. All right. We're module six, everybody. Okay. I want to do a thing, though. Where is it? I, I won't lose the audio on this if I jump to another thing, I don't think. Hang on a second. Everybody can still hear me, right, on the other channel? Okay, yep, I'm back here. Um, yeah, I want to just talk about, I just wanted to talk about module exam stuff. I'm not going to drop all of this. I don't know if I'm going to throw this on the big screen or not. Thanks, Walter. But I just want to walk through some things, okay, some numbers. Walter just ran some numbers here uh, and dropped it over on me, which I was really curious anyway um, while I've been kind of dysfunctional. Um, okay, I'm just going to say these numbers and give you some chance to think about this. There are 59 students enrolled in the class right now. Um, remember I said, uh, do you remember when I said that as long as you don't bail, then you won't fail. But if you, you know, the only way to fail was to bail. Okay. So here's the deal. Uh, module one, there were 48 out of 59 homeworks. Okay. So there are 11 people that never submitted homework one. Okay. You're pretty dang close to cooked right now. It's possible to come back from that if you haven't done that yet, but pretty brutal given the time left, you know, which is what, six, seven weeks or something. And then of the 48 that submitted the homework, only 44 of those actually took the exam. So four people did the homework. Sorry, adjusting my little space heater down here. Four people did the homework and didn't do the exam. Okay, homework two, module two, 37 did the homework, 35 did the exam, homework three, 31 did the homework, 27 of those did the exam, and uh, four has been done for, what, since just before spring break, probably, module four, less than half the class did the homework on module four right now with only 16. Module five, I'm not as worried about other than this taper, you know, which I am worried about. Okay, so I just wanted to encourage you again, um, just encourage you. So A, I am back in the literal saddle um, with minimal back pain and minimal nerve pain at this point. So I'm functional again, which should up the amount of just support resource. I, I think Zach and Walter have been amazing. Um, but you know, but I've been very much a wall. So, and you all know that. So I'm hoping that I can be a little more engaged and a little more of a support, but, but you just have to know, okay, if you're, if you're there and how many people do we have actually, I'm just curious how many people are in, are just right now live we've got, and not everybody does class life, right? Some people just watch it on YouTube a little later. So, but just as a data point, I got six, nine, 12, 15, 
got about 20 people that are on live right now, which is actually pretty consistent with how many um, people have, you know, done, you know, completed module four. So it's, it's not in, it's actually fairly in line. So it may be that any speech giving at this point is wasted because it's the other 29, 39, crap. It's the other, you know, two thirds that haven't done homework for module four that, um, uh, you know what I mean? They're not here. So I could give the speech, but I'm, then I'm preaching to the choir as they say. So anyway, but I just, I do want to encourage you. I do want to encourage you. You gotta, you gotta make that time, make that budget. And I know stuff happens. Crap, man. You know, some of you have had COVID and been wiped out, you know, and, and again, I'm just going to work with you forever on that kind of stuff. Um, and there's no deadlines anyway, but the time, the clock does run out. And if you have legitimate, you know, health needs, personal issues, things that happen that we can talk about, you know, incompletes and stuff like that, please talk to me about that. I tend to be pretty accommodating, especially when we're in this crap, you know, quarantine pandemic, you know, a year in the fricking pandemic. I'm bloody sick of it. Which is why I posted the picture of the lady with the banana on her face. It's just kind of how I feel right now. That's how I feel about the, that's how I feel about the pandemic at this point in the game. That's all just duct tape bananas to our heads. I feel like that's like a step up of the face palm. Like it's just worse. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's just like banana. banana. Just banana. Just like here. Just, banana. Exactly. Oh, now I'm thinking of the minions. The minions, <laughs> they do the banana. Yeah, that's right. Maybe someone can rock a minion, uh, a minion gift for us here with bananas. Yes, anyway, please. but I just wanted to give you the cautionary tale. Okay. Just everybody, just a cautionary tale because we're pivoting right now. We're moving. We just introduced the von Neumann architecture, right? where suddenly, how does this thing even work? Okay, that's a new idea, a bunch of this, okay, this is the hard thing about this class. Um, the individual concepts are not beyond any of you, the individual concepts. The challenge is that there's so much and it kind of comes and then it hits, pivots, hits, pivots, and it's this constant flow. This is my impersonation of constant flow um, or pulling taffy, one of the two. But where, where there's just this, every time you kind of got a thing, we're going to throw another new thing at you. And then we're going to, you know, cause we're really building that whole abstraction from low level transistors, electricity, all the way up to, I just made a computer do, you know, do my bidding. That's a weird journey. You know, that's really, really a weird journey. So, but this is why you just got to strap on. You got to just latch on, strap on for the ride and stay, stay, stay in, stay in. Walter and Zach and I are endlessly willing to, to help you to be successful. Okay. And I'm now, like I said, I'm coming back online with functionality. Not, not perfect, not perfect yet, but man, compared to the last seven weeks, holy crap. So, okay. Like, oh, just, it's so much better. Let me just say that. Okay. All right. You ready for, are you ready for some LC3 instruction set architecture? Um, yeah, Matthew, you got some exams you need to do. So yeah, everybody get after, get after it. All right. I really am encouraged by being back a little more online, you know, that I can sit in my chair for you know, a few number of hours before I've got to get up and walk around a little bit. That's just so much, uh, so amazing. All right, let's do some, let's do some learning. Shall we do some learning? And I also dropped a comment um, earlier. Eddie had, had made a comment about, um, about some of the difficulty of, of where the book is with explaining binary and notations. And I added my little note after that as just kind of an agreement to that, you know, just, just corroborating, not, not to say, yo, Dr. K's lectures are better. That's not my point. My point is that, that those sections of the book are a little bit difficult. And, and I don't think they're, you know, when you're going to try to explain, you know, number systems, and then you think that the best way to do that is by 
making an analogy with um, polynomials. Yeah, I think you're living in a world in which the math is really intuitive to you, you know, where, you know, what'll really help them understand number systems is polynomials. It's really the same thing. And it is, in fact, the same thing. It is. But in my mind, polynomials come later, not first. So they're not hard ideas, but not everybody's rocking that math, you know, that just happy math fluency, right, coming out of the chute. So... Go, go hit my lectures. Go double back on my lectures. Okay. All right. Okay, friends. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Lectures. Feel the wind. Feel the wind. Okay. There is a thing called an instruction set architecture. I'm not going to make, you don't have to remember that word or that acronym. Um. But the instruction set, what we call the, and, and, and don't worry even about the whole ISA, it's in a brief because it's a long instruction set architecture. There's a lot of letters and, and syllables. But the main thing to really remember here is just that computers have architectures. And when you say, you know, tell me about the architecture of this computer, right? I want you to do this thing. Here's the computer you're going to use. The, the higher level you are, the less you care, right? If you're building an app, you know, probably for, for whatever, for a smartphone, you probably don't care. But um, if, on the other hand, you're down in the hardware, nestled down, you're doing sort of stuff, low-level stuff, device drivers, system-level software, whatever. Um, uh, in that situation, then the notion of, you know, tell me about the architecture it's going to include things like how does the, how is the memory organized, right? How much memory is there? Tell me about the registers, right? What do the general purpose registers look like? Um, what are, what's the instruction set look like, right? We already talked about the fact that that in the LC3 you've got four bit opcode, which means you got a maximum of sixteen possibilities. You know. There's actually a little more than that in the LC3 because a couple of them are really like reused. Like we talked about how, um, what is it? What is it? Oh, jump and jump subroutine that they're mostly the same. Only one presumes register seven, that kind of thing. But so they give different, we call them different instructions, but the opcode is the same, right? Um, much like the add and and where we can do it differently. Operands get treated differently but they are, you know, there's like two kinds of ads and two kinds of ands. And so there's a little more than 16, strictly speaking, but maximum 16 opcodes in any case, right? Call them what you want, but what are the opcodes? What's the data types? When we say data types, we mean, okay, sometimes it's unsigned, like an unsigned integer. Does the hardware support floating point? We, we deliberately ignore floating point in this class. We do. It's just more crap to throw at you that you don't need right now. We touched it for one slide, right? Back a little while back. But you know, the fact that like, oh, okay, all signed numbers are in two's complement notation. Well, two's complement notation is what? Oh, it's right here. It's a social contract. That's all it is. Okay, whose complement notation here? Let me try to maybe let me try to emphasize this a little more, if I may. Okay, hang on a second. This is going to be good, and I think it's going to be worth it. Okay, there. Is that working for anybody else? It's so working, Doctor K, and I it's, am enjoying it. It's, it's like a little bit psychotic. It's borderline psychotic. Okay. Two's complement notation. It's just the social contract that says how we, how we're going to do it. What, how do we handle it? You know, what does a positive number look like? What's a negative number look like? And I you feel know, like how, this is the most aggressively I've ever been taught about anything. Yeah. <laughs> I feel well, like the, the, the it. hand kind of gives, <laughs> gives that illusion. <laughs> 
Well, the hand is creepy. The hand is just creepy, right? You the know, hand is the so hand creepy. Is very, the hand is very creepy. It's useful, though, sometimes, like. And it just really, puts emphasis on everything. It's the, hand, the hand brings emphasis, okay? That's why I engage the hand at times. And there's a story behind this hand, which I will not share today. And I want to just say that I've never been more proud as a teacher. I, I didn't actually see on the highlight who said that about being aggressively taught, but I've never been more proud as a teacher than with that bit of, I think it was praise. I'm going to take it as praise. You know what I mean? Uh, I you once take had, it as praise. I once that had was really, absolutely praise. <laughs> thanks, Matthew. I once, when I was at BYU, I had some student who really didn't like me, who in an attempt to denigrate me in an SRIs, said missed his calling as a stand-up comedian. I took that as a great compliment. You know, like, okay, finally someone appreciates what I'm doing up here. Um anyway, I but I think that I think that he thought it was a that it was an insult, you know. But hey, you know, uh, as the expression goes, one man's ceiling is another man's floor or whatever. Uh anyway. All right. So social contract, it just says but all this really is, at the end of the day, kind of social contract, you know? How are we going to do memory? How are we going to do this? What's the format for floating point? Is there like a sacred format? No. Is it the same everywhere? No. Am I going to be aggressive about it and use the hand when I have to? Okay, let's go. And you know what, what, Dr. King? Yeah? I was, I was just wanting to say, like, it's interesting because normally with, like, math and everything, it's derived, right? Everything that we learn, there's a reason mathematically and i know that like essentially the very root of it is social contract but like it's just hard to grasp that concept that concept that people just kind of decided on it you know but yes. like no it's really true eddie it's really really true because look you want to talk about math uh remember we talked about analog versus digital right well that manifests itself in math in nature by real numbers you know versus integers right Integers are these nice, discrete. It's five. It's seven. There's no eighteen point three 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 with a line over that or anything. There's none of that crap, right? Math, you could say, almost is is an an examination of nature. For example, pi, pi. If you want the area of a of a circle, pi is a relationship that just exists. It's a ratio that just exists and has crazy psychotic properties. Like it seems to go forever and never repeats. That is, you know what I mean? But that's mathematicians, I think, feel like they are, for the most part, discovering nature. You know what I mean? That these are like laws. These are somehow physical law, eternal law of the universe kind of stuff. And then, and you're absolutely right, Eddie. And then you get into computer science and you're just like, wait, what is this thing called again? Von Neumann architecture. Who's von Neumann? Some guy, super smart, blah, 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 wrote a paper. That's our thing. And everything really at some level really does kind of feel like just human made, fabricated. Like here it is. Blah. That's it. That's a computer. Anyway, that's a great observation, Eddie. And I've, I've thought about that a lot over my career. The fact that it's so arbitrary, really. But that's what it is. And I like that, honestly, because it also says we can do whatever the crap we feel like. You know, if someone's like, okay, if you're a civil, okay, I'm going to get off this quick. If you're a civil engineer and your client comes to you, this whatever, state of Illinois, comes to you and says, this bridge that you just built across the Mississippi, yes? Uh, can you make it fly? It would be an absurd question. And the answer would be no, because why? You're a civil engineer or mechanical engineer, whatever. Yeah, that's mostly civil engineering that deals with that kind of stuff, right? But if you're a software developer, right? Software engineer, and they come to you and they say, Eddie, this big massive database program that you built that does all these things, can you make it fly? You're like, well, yeah, but, you know, that'll cost you money or, you know, are you sure that's what the market wants? You see what I mean? But the first part is not no. The first part is, well, sure, because there really aren't, you know what I mean? 
there's not much in the way of limitations on us as software engineers. And if we and if you really don't like what von Neumann did, then you go make the new one. You go make the new one, the Chuck architecture. Blah blah blah. Go do it. You can do whatever you want. I love. I actually really really love that about computer science. I'd rather. And this is weird. I'd rather learn that than like, I got a son in med school. They're, you know what I mean? They inherited the system of the human body. And they learn all crazy detail about the system that they just like stumbled on and said, it exists. I'm way more interested in the open canvas, the, the basically not the, not the uh, system we use. I mean like a blank canvas and you're a painter and you do whatever you want. To me, that's what computer science is. I love it. Okay, let me keep moving. I will remain as aggressive. But see, you know why I'm aggressive, Matthew? The reason I feel aggressive is I feel so damn good right now physically. And I've been such a suckwad for two months after, with the surgery. I'm just like, oh, and the sun's out and I'm feeling my out. So let's go. All right. <sighs> Bring it down. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited too, though, Dr. K. Let's do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, last time, what we were talking about, that whole last lecture in module, whatever, five, um, which was about von Neumann, right? Von Neumann architecture. That, that was kind of a generic thing, right? There's memory, there's fetch, decode, execute, there are instructions, right? Instructions. Um, what we do, what we're doing now is we're saying, okay, let's take the von Neumann architecture. We're going to drill down on that a little bit and say, well, how does LC, how does LC three do it, right? What is its architecture, right? So let's start with, and that's what we're going to do right now is just kind of introduce you to the way the LC three works. And within a week, no later than than early next week, I'm going to jump on and and we'll jump on a simulator the LC3 simulator, introduce you to that. It's going to become your, your friend um, and you will like it. Okay, the LC3, the address space. There are two to the 16 locations or addresses, okay? That is, if you're doing the math at home, 65,536, which is not a number I keep around in my head, okay? Now, one of the things you know immediately, immediately, is that if there are two to the 16th locations, oh, and it has addressability of 16 bits. So at every location, there are two bytes, right? So immediately, you know that there are two to the 16th locations, and there's two bytes at every location. So there's two to the 17th bytes of memory, okay? I answered the la that question at the bottom. But what about this one? How big does the MAR have to be? The MAR is the memory address register. That's the register that you push an address into so that it can use the decoder to turn on one spot in memory, right? How big is the MAR? Anybody want to hazard, uh, not a guess, How big is the MAR? Come on. Yeah, yeah, two bytes, 16 bits. 16 bits. Because that allows me to address two to the 16th locations. Because I can have two to the 16th different values. All right. Okay, um, every word in memory. Remember, this is, again, a weird bit of vernacular every spot in memory is called a word why i don't i don't exactly know um but in the lc3 every word is two bytes so one word in memory is two bytes and we call that word addressable if you could address if every address referred to a single byte we would call that byte addressable you could also say that every word was one byte, but usually we didn't drop the word idea and just call them bytes. Okay, let's go. That's memory. And this will get more second nature. This is just kind of your first view. The registers, the general purpose registers. 
remember we talked a little bit about this, that getting out to memory, getting out to main memory, RAM, random access memory, getting out to memory is really time consuming, right? It's like, it's like get out of the building, walk to your car, get in the car, get on the freeway, drive to your house, get out, grab the thing, back on the freeway, drive, you know, and, you know, 45 minute round trip maybe just to go get something. But if that same thing was just in, in my office, let's say, you know, down the hall in a mythological world in which we hang out on campus in classrooms and I go to my office, um, that is a mythological world, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Where we could just kind of go like close by to like my office or even better, like, ah, in my pocket, you know, it's like really close by, right? You can just intuitively feel that, that time difference, you know, the time sink. Well, going everything out onto that bus, putting the MAR in, you know, all that stuff. You'll flip, 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 flip. Remember me doing the little, the little marble unit. Uh, you know, how many times do you have to do a thing to get, you know, to get this operation? So these are the general purpose registers. One clock cycle, bam. And then and the value is just there. It's pushed into the, to the adder, to the ALU which is the arithmetic logic unit. That's all the mathy stuff. Um, we call them R0 through R7, okay? Those are the eight registers. There is this acronym GPR. I, don't, I just don't like all the acronyms, but sometimes you just have to for efficiency, but the general purpose registers, they're all 16 bits. Every one of these registers is 16 bits. And we sometimes refer to this block of eight registers as the register file. You know, it doesn't, again, it really doesn't matter. In truth, it's probably, now the LC3 is a simulator, right? It's, it's not an actual machine, but if it were an actual machine and a lot of times in actual machines, <coughs> excuse me, the registers actually are like a little memory with a little decoder with like three lines so you can get to eight different, you know, turn on which one. And it's literally a bit of memory, but it's really, really fast. Everything's set up to be super fast. Okay. Sorry. I don't, I feel like I'm being attacked by my mustache. You know what I mean? You ever get that people with the mustaches? You ever get that where it's like a, suddenly it's like a, I don't know what the deal is. I get that with long hair. Like, I should it's like, it, right. It's like something's happening. You're like, oh, it's a tickle moment all of a sudden. Okay. Yeah. Now, this is just a reminder. I'm going to just keep coming back to this picture till it starts to just get a little more second nature to you. Okay. And just point out to you that there's the memory down there, right? Down at this whole bottom section that follow my tiny, tiny little cursor down here. And there's the register file right up there. And that's really all we've talked about so far, right? We talked about, yeah, memory and the registers. All the other stuff is happening here with the instruction register, the finite state machine that's like the machinery that's running and doing all the things, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an example of, we're gonna actually program in binary right now. Yes, you wanted it, you asked for it, you got it. You didn't ask did for I it. Did I ask for you it? Did not I don't ask remember for it. asking for it. No, you didn't ask for it. No. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Actually, so, this is kind of exciting. I like it. Okay. <laughs> so th we're going to do the add instruction, okay? So that, first of all, that's the op code for the add instruction. How do we know that? Social contract. We okay. need a theme song for the social we do contract. Need a social. Oh man. I have a confession to make. Um, I was watching Strong Bad videos this morning. Why? I can't say. But I realized that if we wanted a song, a Strong Bad song would really do the trick. We just need a song. I would love it. Wouldn't it be amazing? <laughs> like, got to get the social contract, you know, something. Because of social I think that, contract. I think Strong Bad could do a great social contract song. Let's see what we can do. Okay. All right. So it's social contract. We just decided that opcode 0001 was the ad. 
That's it. Okay. What else are we going to do? There we go. It's add. Now we're going to do the, the add that we're going to do. It has a zero here on the, on that bit five. We talked about, uh, and, and remember that there's an appendix with all of the instruction set stuff, right? All, all of the instructions are there and you got to get used to going to that to reference it. You don't have to memorize these sorts of like, what's the format of all that other stuff. That's all open book. Because real life, when it comes to instruction sets, you know, uh, instruction set architectures, it's always open book. Okay. Over time, when you do a bunch of stuff with it, it gets kind of second nature. But you know what I mean? Well, you'll really kind of just get to remember it, you know, just like you'll remember that that eventually that 1111 is F, which is 15. You'll just kind of know that, you know, and at first you got to think about it, but it becomes more second nature. But we're going to do the one where bit where bit five is zero, which says that that the two values that we're going to add together are coming from a first source register and a second source register. Why? Social contract. Um, and it turns out that these two bits right here just are zeros. We don't care. We don't care what they are. The, the spec says make those zeros. So we do that. We'll be obedient. We're going to say that the destination register, which is where we're going to put the result, is this one right here. It's, and this can be anywhere from zero to seven. So there's eight possibilities. And this happens to be two. So that's going to say whenever we're done, we're going to put, thank you, Ariel, who's going to sign the contract. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the destination register. Register two is the destination. That's where we're going to put the answer. Then the real question is, well, what are the other two registers where we're going to pull the values? So we'll go. Um, so that guy, that guy's register two. He's going to be all zero. So that's going to be. Say it in your head, register zero. And this guy is going to be one. We're just saying like, we're just writing a program and this is what we are going to do. Okay. Now we've just written in 16 bits. We have just encoded. Um, we have just encoded, uh, you know, an instruction, but it really is telling the computer to do a bunch of stuff. Right. And in particular, these 16 bits embody, because of the social contract for how we're going to encode it, if you were to say it in English, it would be something like this. Take the value in R0 and add it to the value in R1. Add those two values together. And when you have the sum, put the result into R2. Done. That's it. That's our little program. It's our little one line, 16 bit, one instruction, tiny little program that why do we even, why, what is it? Why are we doing it? We don't know. We don't care. That doesn't matter right now. And why did I, why, why was this how it filled out? Well, because that's how we decided it. We decided it was an ad. We decided which register. We decided it was going to add values from two registers instead of an immediate value. And we just decided it would be register zero plus register one gives us register two. Or, you know, it, that result gets put into register two. Okay. Are you ready? We're doing it. We're doing it. Not in the simulator, but it's real life. Okay. That is suggesting take this value right there. That's, that's source register. The first source register is that. That's the second source register. We're gonna add those together. See the animation, see what a genius animator I am. Um, and when we're done, we're gonna put that added value over here. Okay, dude, boom, there we just did it. Okay, let's back that up to see the amazing moment in which the, the value here, right? If you look at it, right? It's just, you can look at this two different ways. One is, it's, is that it's all zeros then one one and you added one to it, right? So what's that going to do? 
well, we can look at them right here as if it were a math problem. One plus one is zero, carry the one. One plus one is zero, carry the one. So it should be all zeros and then one zero zero at the end. There it is. Boom. That's it. Okay. Everybody got that? That's that's as simple as that. Now, yes, senor. De nada. So you can do any combo. You could literally have like take our zero, add it, add add our zero to our zero, put the result in our zero, which would effectively just double our zero. You could do that. I mean, there's there's no limitation. Zero through seven, destined for the destination register. Zero through seven for source one. Zero through seven for source two. Any combo of all of that is possible because you said that bit five was uh, was zero. So we're using two source registers. That's it. Boom. Okay. So add is one of the 15 instructions. And again, I'm, I'm fuzzing a little bit on the notion of 15 instructions. Um, so once again, there's four bits and everything else we call operands. So it's like four bits is the, is the op code, right? It's the thing, it's the operation we're gonna do. All the other 12 is like more instructions. I don't know, you're like, if you just walk in and just go add, you're like, um, yeah, you're gonna have to give me a little more information. Like, what do you want me to add? And, 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 and where do you want me to put it when I'm done? You know, that's what the rest of it is all about. Now, here we get into, <clears throat> a, it starts to get a little more funky because this idea of addressing mode, addressing mode is all about where the operands are. You know, where do we get, you know, where do we get the stuff we're going to play around with? And it turns out that for a number of reasons that have to do with ease of programming, there are a number of different addressing modes that just has to do with like, where do I, it's just, where do I get my stuff? Where do I get the stuff you want me to deal with? Okay. So we'll talk more about addressing modes. Okay. So we already talked about the fact that there's very few opcodes and how sophisticated instruction set architectures have many specialized opcodes. Okay. And in fact, I want to do something really quick just cause Hang on a second. Okay, um, I wanted to just pull up really quick uh, the the Raspberry Pi um, instruction set. It's actually the um, the ARM sixty four processor if I can find the dumb thing hang on a second you're like Dr. K you didn't have it just sitting there no why because I'm a dumb dumb all tight I'll get it but I just want you to see that I think the timing is right for you to see this thing Okay, there we go. Just so you understand, you know, at some level how just kind of ugly the whole thing can get when you're not in this little safe haven called uh, called LC3. Okay, so number one, all right, that, that's plenty readable. Okay, this is the ARM uh, version eight architecture reference manual. Um, you see up there, it's about 1,400 pages. It's just a reference manual. This is not a crap ton of, of prose. You know, there's not like a poetry section and some short stories and other stuff. Okay, here we go. Here we go. And what is this documenting? The social contract of the, of the, of the ARM processor, of the ARM version 8. Okay. I, all I want to really show you just a couple of highlights. Um, okay, see right there, see registers. 
there's a whole section on registers. So there are 30, all the general, so just to show you the contrast, in the ARM, all the general purpose registers are 32 bits. And they go from zero, from R0 to R12. That's funky, right? But it turns out that R13 is actually a special purpose register, the stack pointer, but you can manipulate it. And 14 is the link register, which I don't even remember what that is. And R15 is the program counter. In the LC3, that's a separate register. But here it's one of the registers you can just kind of fiddle around with, you know? And there's a bunch of other crap, you know, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, okay, let's go back. How do I go back in preview? What do I do here? Um, let me go right here. I'll give a little table of contents. Okay, but you see what I'm getting at? Every architecture has its own set of stuff. You see how it's just a little different. But you see how many more things there are? There's, and then here's all about the floating, the floating point. Here's about the memory model, right? Oh, the address space, right? It's a flat, single flat address space of two to the 32nd bytes. Two to the 32nd. That tells you what the maximum address, you know, addressability is, right? Maximum size. Uh, let's go. I feel like there should be a back button on my little preview thing here. There probably is. Go up, down, back. Oh, I got it. I got it. It's uh, it's that guy. Okay. Um. Anyway, you see what I, you see what I'm getting at, right? Just that's the kind of stuff. It's all the stuff. System address, some built-in synchronization, semaphores, system timer. Sys tick, that's the clock stuff, debugging crap. Then, oh, here comes the instruction set. Okay. Are you ready? Let me see. That's that's it. Let's go instruction set. There's the format. Let me see. What is this? Format of Oh, that's the format of instruction descriptions. Oh, now we're going meta. Hold tight. And if it's not lost on you, it's not like I have this this uh, document like memorized or like I'm all fluid with everything in the document. No, no, I'm not. Um, okay, where's, let me see, format of instruction description, similar language, pseudocode. Okay, how about instruction set and coding information? Come on, I just want to lay out. I just want to lay out. I don't even know. I've seen it before. Oh, here we go. Here we go. You got you got 32 bit instructions. Yeah. I mean, very much out of my depth, you know, in that respect. Blah 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 for 1400 pages. Oh, here we go. Instruction set encoding. There we go. I'm just trying to a trying to help you understand that there's a much bigger world than the LC3. If we did Raspberry Pi, now there was some discussion about you know there's some other stripped down architectures we could maybe use, and that's totally fair. But I'm just saying this is the kind of crap you wind up having to wade through when you go to like a real a real architecture, and then I've got to like guide you to say avert your eyes, don't look over there, it's scary. Okay, so let me get rid of that. Interesting, a little bit, some level, even if it's only like, ah, oh, yeah, we're okay. We're okay with, uh, we're okay with LC3. Um, also, by the way, there are some things with the simulator that we have a, uh, the simulator, there's a really great simulator that we like to use. There's a few limitations. We have made modifications to the simulator. It's open source. I actually changed it with the help of a student from last semester from this class. And we are going to use, Walter, we got to talk about this is one of the things we got to talk about in the next week or so, uh, is, you know, getting that kind of like hosted someplace where you guys can hit that one instead of the other one, because it's got a, just a few little touches that make it way easier 
to use um, for more legitimate programming. The, the simulator we use has some limitations that are a little arbitrary and they make writing good assembly programs way too hard, harder than the language or harder than the architecture really re would require. Okay. All right. There are three kinds of opcodes. There's operating instructions, data movement instructions, control. We talked about this, right? Operate, data movement, and control. And again, by the way, I don't expect you to run around just like, I'm never going to ask you a question like, what are the three types of opcodes? That is rote memorization, and it'll be gone within, you know, two minutes of leaving. Um, you know, the exam. All right. That is, I've shown you this picture before, but that is the little cheat sheet for all the instructions. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? What, is, what time is it? Oh, we're doing great. Actually, hold on really, really quick. Um, <clears throat> okay, sorry. I just made a food order <laughs> for 12.45. Yeah. Okay, why? Because I can. And because I'm really hungry. Okay, all right. So this is just a little cheat sheet. There's the ad we just did, right? There's the opcodes. There's the destination register, source registers, that bit five magic, immediate versus some register. And every one of these, just you'll, you're going to get just fluent. This is your world for the rest of the semester, programming with this instruction set. It's from a, from a again, because of the simplicity, very, very easy uh, comparatively. And the concepts that you come into are going to be okay. They're going to be good. They're going to, they're going to go with you. All right, let's keep going. Shall we? Okay. Data types. And, and again, as always, I don't even have to, I always say this, but I want to just remind you, please stop me. You know, if you have questions, drop in with a voice, you know what I mean? Jump in on the voice, drop it in the chat. I try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, LC3 has only two data types. Now, this is like the canonical answer from the book, but... Um, I do want to say that it's loosely true. It's approximately true, but, but I think the truth is a little more subtle and a little more nuanced than this, okay? For example, when, they're, when you're doing math, then the assumption is that the value you're looking at, the zeros and the ones, the 16 bits of stuff are in two's complement notation. Okay. Um, is anybody else getting the Discord stream blurry? Just curious if Texas was the only one. Because then you get the latency when you go to YouTube. Or was that just uh, was that just the Texas uh, machine? Um, for okay. me, it's not super blurry. Like there's a little blur, but that could be it just like. For a bit. Okay. But I can still see your face and your eyes and your hair and stuff. So I feel like that's probably good enough. Okay. So whenever there's math, it's two's complement. Okay. We're using two's complement notation. If we're going to do an addition and there's an immediate value, that immediate value is two's complement notation. Just, you know, any addition that's happening in the ALU, two's complement notation. Okay. That's the social contract here. And basically everything else is unsigned. Now, the reason I said there's nuance is that there are other data types that have to do with, okay, here's this unsigned, you know, this unsigned 16 bits of zeros and ones. What is it? What does it mean? Well, I could say, well, it could be an address, right? Because I could use that to reference an address. 
It could be uh, an ASCII value, which we haven't even talked about, have we? Did we talk about ASCII? Yeah, we did. I might yes. have been on narcotics when we talked about ASCII. Um, but yeah, it might be an ASCII value. It might be, um, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that there are other things it could be. Uh, but in any case, broadly, two's complement versus unsigned. That's really all the LC3 at an architectural level really cares about. Okay. <clears throat> now let's talk about, you ready for addressing modes? Okay. Prepare for brain split, just a little bit of brain split here, okay? <clears throat> when we talk about addressing modes, we're talking about where something is that we're going to, you know, like I, I want to do an addition. Well, we already said there's two different ways of doing an add. I can take a source register and another source register, add those together. That's one way. Or I could do a source register and an immediate value. And I would add those together. Well, register, notice right here, register is an, ad is an addressing mode, is, is an addressing mode. I don't know how to emphasize all my syllables properly. Uh, there is a thing called register at ad addressing mode. Why do I want to say addressing mode? I feel awkward right now. Um, there's also another addressing mode or addressing mode called immediate or literal. Okay. So when I flip that bit on the ad, and in one case, I get a second register, that's register mode. But when I flip that and turn it on and I get an immediate value, that's immediate mode. Do you see how they're like, because in the one case, it's like, where do I get my value? What's the social contract say? And you're like, well, it's an ad instruction. Bit five is on. So here's where you're going to get your second operand. It's just those five bits right there. Just grab those five bits. There are two's complement number. Go. I've got it. In the other case, I have three bits. <clears throat> what are my three bits? Oh, they tell me which register holds the value that I'm going to use. So I got to go, oh, three. We see it's all zeros. I'm going to go to register zero, grab the stuff. Oh, now I've got my stuff. Now, there you go. Now go. But I've ultimately got to get my stuff that I'm looking for, right? But, ad you know, addressing modes is all about where I go get it, where, where I'm going to find it, where I should look for it. Does that make sense? Now, immediate and register mode are the easy, are the super easy peasy ones because they're actually broken out, as you can see, as separate ones. And memory addressing modes are, there's different kinds. <sighs> Apparently I'm tired. Okay. So, Immediate and register, the perfect example is just add PC relative, indirect, and base plus offset. Now, again, again, this information is in the appendix that is on Canvas and that will be provided to you whenever you take the module exam. So you don't have to like, you can literally go look it up again if you need to. Okay. <clears throat> because frankly, all the terms, the terms, you jump around from one architecture to another and the terms change often for one thing or another, you know, or exactly how it gets used changes. So you always got to go to the source, you know, of, of that architecture. Oh, and what we're going to do for now, sorry, I'm really fading. I even got some good sleep last night, but I'm, I feel faded. Uh, we're going to come back to this, but just kind of bookmark those. Okay. Just bookmark those. There's one other thing. So this is, again, I'm just trying to give you the like, little bit of the tour of the LC3 so that we can then drill down and you've got a little more lay of the land. There is this thing called a control code or control codes. And it turns out this is really, really, it's, I wanted to say helpful. It's more than helpful. It's essential. Okay. Every time a value, 
I need a powerful stimulant. And this is not it. Sorry. 70% dark chocolate. That ought, to, that ought to give me a little kick. Um, sorry, I have to apologize right now for eating in front of you. But it's delish. Okay. It's either that or yawn my way through the rest of this 15 minutes. Okay. Every time a value gets written into a register, okay, every time a value is written into a register, I'm being very careful in my word choice. It is what a value is written to a register. It doesn't happen on every instruction. If the instruction doesn't have a destination register, then the control codes are not going to be effective. But if there is a destination register, then the architecture looks at that red, looks at that value going into the register. And it says, and there are these three one bit registers. It's craziest thing. They're, they're literally registers and they're one bit each, just one bit, a one bit memory, three little one bit memories. It's weird. If the value going in is negative, then I flip the end bit. If the value is zero, I flip the Z bit. And if the value is positive, I flip the P bit. And whichever one I flip, I zero the others. So it's like if it's if the value is negative, I turn on the end bit, turn off Z and P. If it's zero, turn on the Z bit, turn off N, turn off P. If it's positive, right, I, you know what I do? I turn off the, uh, I turn on the P bit, I turn off N and Z. Now, how do I how do I how do I tell if the value is negative? You know, well, how does it do that? Well, it's it's going to treat it like a two's complement value at that point, and if the leftmost bit is on, it's a negative number. If it's not, it's not. So that's how it knows if it's a negative number, right? So they're just little recipes, right? If all the bits are zero, then that's how I tell. You know, I've got to somehow find a check, a fast check in the hardware for all the bits are zero. And then as long as the first bit is zero and and at least one of the remainders is, is on, I've got a positive number, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so here's why we do it. Here's why we do it. There are these moments where we got to make decisions. And it turns out that when we get to the branch instruction coming up, the branch instruction looks at these. So for example, let's say I want to see if two values are equal, right? You've, you've written code like that in Python, right? If, if whatever, if letter equals, right, quote, C, you know, some value, right? And if it is, you want to do what comes next. And if it's not, you want to jump around it, skip it, right? That would just be like normal Python. Well, how do I tell? How do I tell if they're the same? Down, you're right, in the hardware. How do I tell down in the hardware if they're the same? Well, it turns out I, I see some guesses coming already. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Matthew. Yeah, if C minus C is zero. Okay, right, in other words, I can take the value that I'm trying to compare, right, with this other value, and I can like take this one and negate it. This is, you see that? Do you see how I did that? How I negated a value through, through magic just by manipulating my hand? Eh? Then I add them together. Poof, zero. That's my. I swear I'm on no narcotics. I am. This is all I've had today. Um. <laughs> Dr. K, this is all normal behavior for me, so I'm I'm not worried about it. Well, and your noises are amazing. So. You and me, Eddie. You and <laughs> me are rocking. Really weird, I hope others I'm are awesome. on board. I hope others are on board, and if not, it, you know, it's not going to affect any of the way I live my life. You know, what I mean, I'm still going to do this thing. It won't. Okay, so 
You know why I'm punchy? Because I spent two freaking hours this morning on the phone with an insurance company and a healthcare provider because the first one told me that they can't call the other one. The other one has to call them. And the other one told me that they can't call, that the other one has to call them. And I went like, and I spent all morning until eventually there was a conference call with me, just the patient. And I had them all laughing. And that was my success of the day. And it just said, because I could have been Mr. Grumpy Pissy Boy, right? Could have been that guy. Yeah, now you people need to get your act together. I could have gone full Karen on that phone call. It's not my style to do that. But I'm just saying far better to take these two people who hate their jobs and get them laughing. Boom. That's why I'm feeling so great. Because that was my success of the day. And I think I'll know in a month whether I was successful in my quest. True story. Anyway, all right. But so, yeah, so no, Matthew's dead on. Um, I can take this value, right? Negate it, add it together. Poof, if it's zero, well, how do I know if it's zero? Because I wrote a value somewhere, I added them, and I just saved the value. If it was zero, boom, the Z-bit is set. Turns out the branch instruction, I can tell the branch instruction which of the control codes to look at. Hey, branch instruction, if the Z-bit is set, go ahead and jump. If it's not, don't jump. So you'll just fall straight through. You see how that's the mechanism that can that could give you an if statement, right? Because what does an if statement do? You see my impersonation of an if statement? What does the if statement do? It's like, check this condition. If it's true, drop straight in, right? Just do what's next in the in line. If it's not, skip right? And in Python, that's just with indentation. In other languages, you have to have like an opening bracket and a closing bracket, something to group that together. But in Python, it's just done with indentation, which is super great in my opinion, right? Do you get it? If, if it fails, I skip all the way around it. I got to jump, but it's conditional. It's conditional. If they're the same, I drop in. If they're not, I, I jump around. Boom. This is what makes that happen at the assembly level. Okay. Now, and, and again, this was all just kind of high level, you know, some teasers. So that's not everything. We're going we're gonna to come back to it. Uh, we're going to drill down. Okay. So we are going to talk about the operate instructions, which I find linguistically clunky. I want to call them something else like operation instructions or this is what they're called. Here we go. It turns out that there are only three of these in the LC3. They are add, which is arithmetic. That's two's complement arithmetic. I got and, it's the second one, which is bitwise operation, right? Remember, I've got these values. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bitwise and them together. And I've got not. That's it. And I know you're maybe thinking, what about or? Remember the circuits? How ands and nans and these other things that you can build. Once you have an and and a not, you can build everything. Everything else can be done. If we keep it true. Same thing with add. Once I have an add, I can do everything else. I can subtract. That's easy. I just have to flip all the bits and add one to negate um, a, a value in order to do a subtraction. But I just, but I still, I'm only doing an add, right? Sorry, if I'm trying to do a subtraction, I don't have a subtract instruction. I take the second value, I flip all the bits, I add one, that negates it. Whatever it was, it's now the opposite sign. Then I add them together, boom, done. Right? To do multiplication, I just need to add a lot. To do division, I need to subtract a lot. I mean, it, it all just built. It is witchcraft. Yes, Eddie, it is pure witchcraft. Blows my head. Honestly, truly, such tiny little tools. Do you see my tiny tools? Very tiny. And then you build all this stuff. And then eventually, you're playing, I don't know, what's the game of choice? Fortnite. I don't know what the game of choice is. <sighs> okay, here we go. Let's talk. Then we're going to break them down. We already did the add instruction. 
Let's do not. You ready for not? We're in it now. We are in it. We're deep. Uh, yeah, yeah. So add is an operated instruction. Yes, Gabe, for bingo. Yes. See right there? Operated instructions. LC3 has three of these. But good confirm. But good, good way to confirm, Gabe. Here we go. Not. You ready? That's the op code. Why? You know why. Social contract. We just we just decided. That's what it is. It's got a destination register and a source register. And these guys are just ones. That's it. Okay. So that's all. There's a destination register. A source. All I'm going to do is say, grab whatever the value is in the source register. Flip all the bits. Zeros become ones. Ones become zeros. Done. Put it into whatever the destination register is pointing at. That's it. So here's an example. Okay. Now, what you're going to notice here is I am, I've broken out a microscopically tiny chunk. Remember the crazy LC3 with the pink and the, uh, you know, the butt ugly, whatever thing. Um, so Josh, those are not the only three op codes. They're the only three operate instructions, which is a subset of the op codes. There are still coming up. Where was it? Come on, come on. Right there. Three types of op codes. There's operate instructions, data movement instructions, and control instructions. Boom. Right? So, but yeah, there are only three. And this is part of why I don't like operate instructions, honestly, because it makes you feel like, oh, op codes, right? That's where you were going, Josh, right? I think is like operate instructions sounds like op codes. And to me, it's too fine of a distinction and therefore not helpful. So, um, all right. Not a, the not instruction is a unary instruction because it only has one operand. But here we go. So this, these are our registers, right? And I, I just, I didn't worry about the other values, you know, elsewhere. I don't, because we don't care right now. What I know is that the source register is R5, because there it is, 101. 110. Sorry, strong bad is still in my head. Um, the, um, I'm talking technology. So 101, there's R5. And so that tells us that that's R5. So that is our source value right there. The value in R5. That's the value of that for, of that operand that we're gonna we're gonna not that value. We're gonna flip all of its bits. <clears throat> what the what the what the control unit does is it it basically sends this value in R five right there. Boom! See it going into the ALU here as A. Okay. And then on the side, it tells the ALU what, the, like, here's a value in A. Don't worry about what's in B because I'm going to tell you that what you're supposed to do is just the not instruction. And then the ALU goes, oh, it's a not instruction. Yeah, I won't even look at B. It doesn't even matter. You know. I'll just look at A. Boom. Takes A, goes, looks at it, flips all the bits. That's the sound of bits flipping. That was pretty good. That was spontaneous. How's that go again? I'm pretty proud of it. And then once it's got all the bits flip, sound effects have taken place, then it's going to say, well, where, where, where do you want to put it? And it'll go, oh, it's going to go into R3. Register 3 gets that. Then it's going to go joinky, joinky, boing, and drops in right there and puts it into R3. Boom. That's it. That's That's the not instruction. And that's actually a pretty low level of detail. You understand I'm showing you a hardware schematic? We're at hardware schematic time right there. Not bad. Again, stop when you got any questions. You know, just if you have anything. Um... <laughs> yeah, Eddie, yeah. <clears throat> I do the same thing. Uh... All right, we already did the add instruction, but let's just review this, okay? It's a binary operation, meaning there are two operands, not to be confused with binary arithmetic. 
Okay, there we go. That's the layout, right? When bit five is zero, there's a second source register and these two bits become zeros. When bit five is one, then we got a five bit immediate value. Oh, watch the tricky animation. Check out my animation. Watch carefully. I'm going back and forth. Add and, add and, add and. That is the most incredible animation I've ever made, right? The add, what's the difference between the two? Oh yeah, the name and the opcode. That's it. Add is 0001 and the and is 0101. Otherwise, they're exactly the same in terms of how we encode them. The only diff obviously the difference when they run is that the add treats whatever the operands are as two's complement numbers, as you know, integers in two's complement notation. Whereas the and instruction just treats them as just 16 bits and it's just gonna bitwise and them. Each one, you know, gets anded with the bit that lines up with it. That's it. Okay, here we go. Let's do this one. It's going to be exciting, and then we'll probably stop on this. So here we go. There's and. We're going to take the value. So bit five is zero. So we're going to take the value in, in register four and the value in register one, and we're going to and those together. So let's do it. There they are. There's R4 and R1 right there. We're going to and them together. And as, as you look at it, you can see that anytime there's a zero, right, what happens when you drop a zero into an and? It just blows up. You, you you drop a zero into an and, you're like veto. No, you're like, no, I don't care what the other one is, but this is a no, because I said no, and and says, no matter how many lines are coming in, if anybody vetoes, the answer is no. Unanimous or no. That's, a, that's what and does. So you can actually look at this and go, okay, all those zeros are just gonna blow it up. You can see it right now, right? It doesn't matter that these are ones. Those zeros are gonna blow it up. And then down here, there's a zero over there. So that bit right there is the only one that's gonna survive. You know, if you look at it either as bit one, if you wanna call it that, right? Bit one's gonna survive when we do this operation. There it is right there, you see it? Now that was all really fast, right? We, we anded these two values together in the ALU and the result was pushed out into R5, boom, right there. And that is R1 versus R4. We didn't do anything to R1 or R4. They didn't go away, okay? All right. Now, then I guess, yeah, I'm gonna do this real quick because we're, we just did it, but, but going now to an add instruction, um, so we just did the and, but we're gonna do the add right now. Um, we got, we're gonna take uh, register four as the first operand. Oh, bit five is on. So we have an immediate value here. This value is a five bit twos complement number. You can see it's a negative number right there. Okay, so here's what we do. There's the instruction right there. It's in the instruction register. This, this instruction is being decoded in the instruction register right there. That one bit is wired over here to basically tell, this is just a multiplexer. There's values from the registers coming this way and a value from this immediate space coming that way. And that bit is just a multiplexer that decides who gets to go through the traffic light. And that when that bit is on, it goes, no registers, not you. Here, five bits of value, come on in. If that bit is zero, it goes, oh, five bits? No, that's not what's going on here. Register value, come on down, okay? It's a little traffic cop. Um, now, the other thing that it does, we have this idea here, it's always, uh, it's always abbreviated uh, as sext, which has taken on meaning in the last decade, you know, as a really questionable um, social uh, media slash texting uh, behavior. Uh, so apologies, but that's the term, sexting. Not sexting, sext. 
but we'll just call it sine extent. Having said sext three times now, I'll just say sine extent. It's not that much more difficult. But what we're going to do is sine extend it. Now, we'll talk later about sine extension. Okay. Now, did we talk about sine extension already? Yes, we did. We did. We already talked about it. I was probably on narcotics. That's a negative number. So we sine extend with ones to beef it out to, to 16 bits. Then we'd let the 16 bits drop into the ALU along with the value indicated by that register, which we don't show the wires, but there's a value indicated R4. There's the value of R4. Joinky drops on in. Now we're going to take that value right here, which is the sign extended immediate value and the value coming out of register four. We're going to add those together and we're going to put the result into register one because that's the destination register. Isn't it amazing in 16 bits that we've encoded that much information? Do all that because we have a social contract. So if I go, you know what that means. I don't know what that means exactly, but it's from the sting, I think. Paul Newman and Robert Redford used to do that to each other, I believe. It means something. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're out of time. I think I got food coming. I encourage you to get eat well, eat well. Uncle Chuck says eat well. We're going to come back. We're going to be on 39, which is going to be like, you know, we're going to go really raw now and dig in, okay? But we'll come back to this part right here, uh, slide 38 on Thursday. If you're behind, I beg you, get after it. And Walter, Zach, and I will help you. Especially Walter and Zach, but I'm coming online. So, all right, my friends, I'm done. You're done. Thanks, Dr. K. You're welcome. Good luck to everybody. I'm going to go ahead and kill my stream right now.